Hey there everyone, Mr. Lewis here, ready to go through sections 2.3 and 2.4 of Unit 2, Population and Migration, here in AP Human Geography. So, uh, if you're one of my distance learners, thanks for tuning in. If you are one of Mr. Hoffman's or Mr. Arcella's students who happen to be at home for a little while, thanks for tuning in as well. I hope this uh, helps you a little bit here today. So, we're going to run through the notes. It's actually very, very quick. Um, there's two sections, but they are, they are very streamlined and, and right to the point. And then I'm going to introduce you to a website uh, that deals with something called population pyramids that you're going to be using in your population pyramid 3x5 activity in Buzz. And this will just kind of give you a little peek into that. All right, let's go. Okay, so section 2.3 is called population composition. And what we mean when we say composition is uh, the, the components that make up a population. And the two main components or elements that we're looking at today are age and sex. So on this diagram that you see here, this is what we call a population pyramid. On the y-axis, this vertical arrow, this is where age is measured, with oldest ages being at the top and youngest at the bottom. On the left, you have the males in that society broken down by age, and then the females on the right. So as we look at this, there are really two main purposes that it can serve. One is to assess the population growth or decline in that society. Two is to predict the types of markets that are going to be needed. So the goods and services that people are going to need if you have a really large youth population or a very large elderly population or somewhere in between. Now, as we look at these population pyramids, there are a bunch on these notes. Here's the United States. Um, here's uh, uh, Mexico. Okay, here's China. And you can start to see that they take on very different shapes as we jump from one to another. And really, they're telling us a story, right? They're, they're showing us the history of population in that country over the last 100 years, really. Denmark, we've talked about Denmark. They're seeing this huge drop-off in fertility. We've talked about uh, China, for example, and how they implemented the one-child policy. And you can see the drops in fertility over the last few decades. So they tell us a story. One thing we also can see from population pyramids that you're going to find out later on is the level of development in that country. As fertility starts to tailor off a little bit or decrease, that could suggest a lot of things, and we're going to see some of those things here in a moment. The reason I clicked out of the notes here was to show you the website that you're going to be using for the population pyramid activity that we're asking you to do this week, which is uh, just called populationpyramid.net. And in this website, you can jump to any country in the world or the world itself, like I have up here now, and you can see that particular population pyramid. So again, from oldest ages down to the youngest, the percentages that make up those populations, both in terms of females and males, and then if you hover over it, it'll actually show you the specific number, the exact number of people in that category for that country, or in this case, the world. So for example, in the world right now, there are about 218,833,002 males aged 50 to 54, as it says over here. So you also see this graph here on the right that's showing you population growth over time. And whereas in 1950, the world population was 2.5 billion, by 2100, it's expected to be over 10 billion, almost 11 billion. So that's a big number. And so then you can click on any individual country, and you can go through the alphabet and look at all of them. And we'll go with uh, uh, Guam here. And then you can see how the pyramid changes. And you can just click around until you see something that really jumps out at you and, and start to see how the, the shapes change. You had a, a population article yesterday with Germany. Here's Germany's population pyramid. You can see that there is this large, um, I don't want to say elderly, but, but middle-aged, getting ready to retire, most likely, class of uh, uh, generation of people. And then down here, it's very skinny, meaning there are not a ton of young people set to replace this huge um, middle-aged population in Germany that likely was responsible for a lot of the economic growth in the area, right? So that's concerning involving uh, the economy and, 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 and the jobs that need to be met there 
and whether they will be met. And so you saw with Germany, one of the things they were doing was welcoming in immigrants because they know we're going to need some people to replace a lot of these workers who are in this age range up here that are getting ready to retire. So that's just one potential consequence involving the economy in this regard that uh, could stem from this imbalance of population. So continuing on with the notes, we'll move past the population pyramids here and get into population dynamics. Population dynamics refers to the changes in a population. Is it growing? Is it declining? And what are the factors uh, involved there? So it comes down to really two main categories. One is the natural change, fertility and mortality. Fertility being birth, mortality being death. And we usually measure fertility in one of two ways. There's crude birth rate, which is just total births per 1,000 people is how it's usually measured. And then there's fertility rate, which is the average number of births that a childbearing woman will uh, uh, give in her lifetime, the average number of births that, that she will have, excuse me, and, and the average number of babies that, that she'll have, basically. So the mortality rate is the death side of things. So crude death is total deaths per 1,000 people in the population, whereas infant mortality is the number of deaths that will result um, from uh, uh, babies who are, are between ages zero and one. It's a, it's a tough statistic to really consider, but obviously it's a very telling statistic. If you have a high infant mortality rate, meaning there are a lot of babies who do not make it out of the first year of life, then that suggests some pretty negative things about your healthcare system, about the medicine in your country, uh, potentially about how women are, are treated in your country. And, and so we'll talk more about that later on. The other side of this equation is the migration side of it. Okay, there's emigration and there's immigration. There are people who leave emigration, they're exiting, and there are people who come in, immigration. They're coming into the country, right? So between all three of these factors, we can assess overall population growth in a few different ways. One is the natural increase rate, and this is what we call uh, um, crude birth minus crude death. So you just have the total number of births minus the total number of deaths per 1,000 people, and that's going to give you the overall natural increase, or if deaths are greater than births, the overall natural decrease. The doubling time is the amount of time that it actually takes to double the population. Okay, that is kind of a strange thing to think about. And it could be hundreds of years. It might be uh, only a few years in some countries' cases. But doubling time tells you a lot about how fast or how slow that population is growing. Finally, the demographic equation. This is taking everything into account, not just births and deaths, but also immigration and emigration. So you would take birth plus immigration minus death plus emigration. And that's going to give you the overall growth or decline. Here's an example on a graph. And you will have to answer some questions on graphs moving forward. This question, um, or this graph, excuse me, shows you the birth rate in blue, the death rate in the bright red here, and then the natural increase in this dark red color. And what you can see is that at any, at any point, at any year, which is measured on the x-axis, the gap between these two curves, birth and death, is just the natural increase. So here, birth looks like it's about 39 maybe um, uh, out, of a, out of 1,000, and then death looks like it's about 21 maybe. So natural increase would be 18. That makes sense. Over here, the two are essentially the same, and so natural increase is almost zero. So... What are some of the larger causes and consequences here? One example in real life is Japan. Japan has an aging population, plummeting fertility rates, and because of that, an overwhelmed social system. I would encourage you to watch this video. Sorry about the announcement. I would encourage you to watch this video. It's only four minutes long. I'm not going to play it now. And then go to these FRQs and pause this video and then come back and I'm gonna talk about the answers. So what I want you to do, these are practice free response questions. The free response portion is one third of your AP exam. Take a moment here and look through these questions and try to write one or two sentences that you think sufficiently answer these questions. 
And I will tell you questions two and three where it says identify and explain. Those are two point questions. You have to identify and explain. Don't just identify. A lot of people fall into that trap. Make sure you actually explain. I would write one sentence identifying and one sentence explaining. So pause this video and then come back when you're ready. So we're going to keep going. Japan, question number one here, Japan is a more developed country. All right, so they have more developed education, economy, uh, medicine, healthcare system. That's what more developed means. Discuss one reason that a more developed country might have a larger elder dependency than a less developed country. There are a couple of reasons that I'm going to throw at you here. One, and these are all acceptable answers. It doesn't have to be only one specific answer. One reason here could be that in more developed countries, there tend to be more economic and educational opportunities for females in that country. So they might end up having less children overall because they have other potential prospects, right? Other fulfilling prospects such as a career or, or educational attainment. All of these things um, can, can keep women from having uh, a higher fertility rate. So in more developed countries, because women are allowed those opportunities, which is a great thing that we have in places here like the United States, in other countries, women are not given those same opportunities. And culturally, they are expected to have as many children as they can. And so in more developed countries, as you develop, the country's fertility rate tends to decline. That's not every developed uh, country, but it tends to decline. And because of that, you might end up with a low youth population. The other side of things is the large elder population. Why is that? Well, in a more developed country, you're going to have better medicine, uh, a better healthcare system. You're going to have basic needs met and, and people are going to take care of their elderly. There are better nursing homes, at-home medical services, all kinds of things. So, so either side of those would be acceptable reasons. Um, uh, any side of that equation that I just gave you would, would both be acceptable reasons for a more developed country having a larger elder dependency. Higher life expectancy because of better medicine, better healthcare, and lower fertility rates because women are provided with educational and economic opportunities. So question number two, identify and explain one social consequence a country faces as its population ages. Well, when we think about social, that could be actually like social interaction, but it could also be things that fall on the social system, meaning the government. If a country's population is aging overall, so the average age keeps going up and up and up and up, meaning there's probably a large elder dependency is what that's saying. The, the overall population continues to get older and older and older. Well, there's certain needs that have to be met. And if those needs aren't met by the youth population because they're overwhelmed because there is just such a high, large, uh, uh, such a high elder dependency, that social system meaning the public health care system, the uh, 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 you know, um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid and, and things like that, that might be a little overwhelmed if these elderly folk don't have other people to rely on and, and they can't work anymore at a certain age and shouldn't have to, right, if they've been working up through 60, 70 years old. And so it ends up becoming a, a burden on the system. And, and that's a tough word to use because we don't think of our grandmas and grandpas like that. But if the government has to provide for all of them, that could be a, a huge weight on the social system. The other side of this is what if there's a big generational gap? There could be a large generational gap between the young people and the elderly population. And if there is, that could lead to social consequences in terms of um, this gap creating sort of alienation between the two groups because the younger population might not feel that their needs are being met. They might not feel like uh, the government is as responsive to their needs because the government has to be responsive to the elderly needs, right? So that could be uh, uh, any number of things, but those are a couple acceptable answers. Finally, number three, identify and explain one economic consequence a country faces as its population ages. Well, as people get older, they're going to get to retire at some point, right? That's the whole idea. Good for them. They deserve it. But as they're retiring, if there not, aren't enough young people to fill those economic positions, those jobs, right, and be productive and produce and generate for the economy, that economy could face decline. It could face depression. 
And that's going to hurt everybody. It's going to hurt overall jobs and income, and, and they might f face higher rates of poverty. That could be a huge issue. On the other side of things, let's think about like a positive consequence, right? You might have uh, a lot of business opportunities for things that elder populations need. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're a business person, there could be opportunities for a lot of at-home medical services, nursing homes, uh, hospitals, things of that nature. So that could be another consequence based on the needs of that aging population. So I hope that gives you an idea of, of a little bit of an idea of how to answer these free response questions. You're going to have more practice with this, and, and we're going to continue to get better and better at it as we go uh, throughout the school year here. But I hope that helps give you some insight into how to answer those FRQs. I would recommend always writing at least two sentences for those, but really no more than four. Try to keep your FRQ answers um, you know, detailed enough that you show you really know the topic and you explain it thoroughly, but don't overwrite. I think two to four sentences is the sweet spot. So if you have any questions about these, uh, these topics or, or the FRQs in general, we can certainly go over those in class or feel free to shoot your teacher an email. All right, have a wonderful Thursday, everyone. See you later.